Good evening, everybody. Hope you're ready for a Bible class here tonight. We're back in the book of Acts. I appreciate you all being here. And I noticed a few people uh, more listed tonight than last night. I don't know if uh, last night the chat roll even worked. But nevertheless, uh, uh, glad you all are, uh, are on there tonight. And I hope that the Bible class is a blessing to you. Um, turn to Acts chapter 14. We're going to start there in a moment. I want to mention something to you. Um, this is insignificant as to dates. But on this date, 50 years ago, I trusted Christ as my Savior. On the, in that year, it was on uh, Thursday night. And um, Thursday night, about 10 o'clock, um, I had uh, irritated my wife so that she got up and went to bed. Our boys were already in bed. And I uh, didn't want to watch the news. And in those days, I think we had four channels on the television. So I turned off the television, sat there in the dark for a while, pretty disgusted with everything. And I got up and went to the bathroom thinking I'll take a bath and I'll feel better. And when I got into the bathroom, I knelt down at the tub. I'm not sure why I knelt at the tub. I am sure that when I was knelt there, I recognized myself for what I was. I said aloud, Lord, I'm a mess. Please save me. What happened at that time was the Lord recognized the sincerity, in other words, that I wasn't pulling his leg as I had tried my best to be as hypocritical as I could have been in my previous life. And at that particular moment in time, I was saved. I felt the peace of God. I remember the next thoughts that entered my mind, and I don't, it wasn't instantaneous, but I don't think it was a long period of time. My thought was, is that all there is to salvation? And I never doubted that salvation. Now, question it, go back in time, redo it. As I learned scripture, uh, which didn't occur for many years, I didn't learn any scripture to speak of for about nine years. But as I learned scripture, I went back over that period of time and back over that moment in time many, many times. And I've never came away from that moment with the thought that I wasn't saved. In other words, when I looked at that, I examined that, I did so on the basis of knowing that it was an absolute dependence upon what Jesus Christ was and, and was to me. I never had any trouble believing in Jesus Christ. I always did. I never had any trouble believing that he was the Savior of the world, that he died for men's sins. I never had any trouble believing all of that. I sang the songs that represented that, had them memorized, uh, sang them as my dad used to sing them on the job. I would sing them with him, not, you know, not standing side by side in harmony, but I mean, I'd sing along. I knew those songs. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. I had no doubts about who Jesus Christ was. I believe that there were more than one man who taught, who preached the gospel of Christ in front of me, and through that preaching, it taught me that one day, if there was any hope for me, it would be dependent upon Jesus Christ. And I trusted him that night. I didn't trust him in the manner in which I describe it today, but I didn't know it in the manner that I describe it today. But I simply gave up. I gave up in my own uh, uh, hypocrisy. I gave up in my own uh, ability to do anything. I said to him, Lord, I'm a mess. Please save me. I believe he heard that. And I believe that on the basis of Romans 10, verse 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It isn't that I thought calling upon the name of the Lord was going to save me, but I did call upon the name of the Lord, and I had no reason to doubt my salvation. Now, I don't care who likes or doesn't like that testimony. I really don't. That's my testimony. It's the manner in which I was living at the time that I understood my need, and I trusted the Lord on the basis of that. Now, I hope that uh, you've got a testimony. I don't believe your testimony will be the same as mine, though I believe if you're saved, we will have trusted in the same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't believe that we'll have the same story. 
I could have told my story to last out this whole hour. Took about, uh, what, two or three minutes maybe? Uh, no more than three or four. And that's a good way to tell it. I've told people for years in Bible classes that you have about two minutes with a stranger. And so you should be able to tell your, give your testimony in about two minutes. Now, I, uh, I hope that for the benefit of those of you who are uh, listening here tonight, that um, you have a testimony. Or if it's sometime off the archive in the future, if you're listening to that, I don't want you to copy my testimony. I want you to have your testimony of your faith in Jesus Christ. I know that we all know from the gospel of Christ that it's what he did, and therefore it's not our works nor even the ability to put faith in him that gets us saved. It's what he did, his faith in God the Father and in his word that caused any of us to be able to be saved. I also know that we do put faith in Jesus Christ and that that is an exercise of faith and yet that's not a work. That's not a physical thing. That's not a, that is not a emotion thing. It's not an emotion thing. Uh, so therefore, it is not considered a work, uh, not a work of righteousness as in the case of, say, baptism or learning something. I don't believe people have to be brilliant about the gospel of Christ to get saved by it. I believe they have to trust it. They have to trust who Jesus is, what Jesus did, what Jesus did it for. And I believe that if you'll trust Christ as your Savior, you'll save you right now. You don't have to stand up, sit, sit up, sing up. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to kneel anywhere. You don't have to beg God. And you don't have to learn anything. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That'll do it. So you trust the Lord. Trust Him right now. Now, having said all of that, it does celebrate the 50th anniversary quite well to be able to tell this to you on, as Barry Hampton used to say, on the World Wide Web speaking to 7 billion people. Uh, I appreciate very much it being on the air, and I hope that nothing fouls up it getting put on the archive so that it stays there a while. Anyone who ever looked up Jerry Lockhart ought to look up Jerry Lockhart testimony and find tonight. Now, who knows what's going to happen in the future? I certainly don't. I know that I know what the Bible says is going to happen in the future, but I mean what's going to happen in the future in, uh, with us in this country and with this apparatus that we use, uh, referring to it as the World Wide Web or the Internet or whatever we want to call it. I don't know what's going to happen with that. We may all get blocked from this one day. There are certain countries right now where it is not possible for you to legally own a King James Bible. And there's things like that that you should consider in your activity for the Lord. There must be something that you can do about that, and I wish you'd get on with it. Uh, <laughs> I want you to understand something. We who are of an age, we're not quitting. We don't quit till we draw our last breath. But you do know the difference in the amount of energy people have, don't you? So therefore, don't shy away from who you are and where you are Use whatever energy you have to promote who Jesus Christ is to the world. And I hope that you do that. All right. Now, back to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 14. And if you'll notice back, actually, Acts chapter 13, verse 50 says, But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. But they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came into I unto Iconium. In verse 50, being literally and bodily expelled from their coast uh, is the, the first persecution that Paul uh, uh, was, was uh, in on, was a party to. Uh, before that, uh, going all the way back to Acts chapter 9, after, he, after his salvation on the road to Damascus, there isn't any persecution mentioned. And yet here there is. Now look in chapter 14. He's in Iconium, verse 3. Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made, both of the Jews, uh, Gentiles, and also to the Jews, ah, 
And when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it and fled. Now, second persecution. In other words, right there within a few verses of one another are the first and second persecutions. Look down, if you will, in verse uh, 19. And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city supposing he had been dead. In other words, there's number three, the third persecution. Uh, now, the point of bringing that out is to show you that in this first 11 or 12 years, between Acts chapter 13, verse 1, and the end of Acts chapter 14, in, the, in that number, dozen or so years there, there really was persecution. Now, later on, some roughly three to five years later, somewhere around five years probably later, the Apostle Paul writes 1 Corinthians, and then just a few verses after that, or a few months, if you will, after that, he writes 2 Corinthians. Now, what I want you to notice, thinking about these uh, three persecutions that you can see here in chapter 13, verse 50, chapter 14, verse uh, 6, and chapter 14, verse uh, 19. Think of those three persecutions, but go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Now, it's a fascinating chapter, chapter 11. He's going to tell you about his persecutions here. Now, he isn't telling you about these persecutions to get you to feel sorry for him nor is it, was he trying to get the Corinthians to pay him some sort of homage over it. He wanted them to understand why they ought not to be arrogant toward anyone, him or anyone else, who came unto them to minister to them. Nor why they should be reticent in thinking maybe they could get out there and preach the gospel. He implored them, if you'll recall in chapter 11, uh, I mean, in chapter 10, he implored them to preach the, the gospel to the regions beyond them, to take it somewhere else. He says, how can I take it somewhere else if you won't take it somewhere else? You're the extension of me, is what he was telling them there. So down in chapter 11, I want you to notice, he, he says here, and this is, this is a tough passage, and I, I, this does not fit into our study of the book of Acts, as much as it fits into the time frame of the book of Acts. Okay? I don't know if you catch what I mean there or not, but hang with me. Notice, if you will, in verse 16, chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16, I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. Why would he say a thing like that? Because he is unto them an example, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ, remember? And so he is unto them an example, as he is to you and I, and he's saying, don't think me a fool, even though it would look foolish to you for me to boast about what I am. It's not foolish for him to boast about what he is. Notice, if you will, back in uh, uh, chapter 10, notice verse... Uh, Eight. Look in 2 Corinthians 10, 8. For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority. Why would he say that? Because he, sh he could have boasted more of his authority and been authoritative to those people. But what he's trying to get them to understand is why. Go over back to chapter 11. And he says, it's not wrong for me to be what might appear foolishly making this boast. Notice verse 17. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Now, I'm telling you, this is a very important thing for preachers to understand. Now, it's probably the bulk of you on here are not preachers, although some of you do. Many of you do probably preach as much as I do. I'm not trying to differentiate, but if it's right for a preacher to do it today, if it's right for him to have a certain attitude, to be a certain manner, have a certain mannerism, wouldn't it also be right for you, even though you're not a preacher? Maybe not in a pulpit, maybe not in front of a Bible class, maybe not on the street talking to three or four individuals, but what about your own persona and when you talk to individuals who are willing to speak with you about the Lord? You should be like the preachers 
who are teaching the Word of God. We are to be like Paul was in handling the Word of God. And that we is all of us. Now look here in this very important passage of Scripture. It doesn't get often preached. Notice verse 16. I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting, seeing that many glory after the flesh. I will glory also. Why would he do that? Verse 19, For you suffer fools gladly, seeing you yourselves are wise, in other words, if you suffer fools, do you know what you're doing? You're allowing fools to gain something from you and you think you're wise enough to get around it. He says, seeing that many glory after the flesh, I will glory also for you suffer fools gladly, seeing you yourselves are wise. Well, think about your wisdom. If your wisdom isn't coming from the Word of God, isn't coming from the Lord Himself through His Word, then your wisdom is useless against the fools that would come uh, your way. And yet he says to these people, you suffer fools gladly. Look at verse uh, 20. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. Who are these people? They're people who, have to gain, who gain the advantage over you. You are suffering them, though they are foolish in their approach to you. They are not doing it after a godly fashion, and they're not doing any um, service unto you as a child of God. And yet, you take from them. You suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself. Who does that against you? Well, there's all kinds of people that do it against you. Behold, the tax man cometh, right? I mean, think about who you are. Think about who you are in Christ. Think about who you are in Christ with His Word in your hand. How long has it been since somebody like a Mormon or a JW, a Jehovah's Witness, showed up at your door? And how well did you handle that? How was the Word of God fixed in your heart and mind that you could handle that? Maybe you did wonderful. Praise the Lord. Maybe you wish they weren't there and you said, I don't have time to talk to you. Bing. Shut the door. Or maybe you said, stood there and you stammered around and you shifted your weight from one foot to the other and you folded your arms and you didn't know how to answer them. Shame on you. Study the Word of God. Find out how you should answer them. You're supposed to, as Peter said, have a reason of the hope that is in you. To say to any man. So he goes on. In verse 21. I speak as concerning reproach. As though we had been weak. Howbeit. Wherein soever any is bold. I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Now I want you to think now. Of what Paul is saying here. This is a little difficult. But this grows out of the first two segments of Paul's ministry. You're in 2 Corinthians. Let's think about this for just a moment. I, I'm going to try this, do this on diagram-wise, and this may not come out right, but I hope it does. In the first uh, minute part of Paul's ministry, and I'll come over here with it like this, and I'm going to say this is Acts chapter 13. I'm not saying that's when his ministry started. I'm just saying that it breaks down for my purposes this way. I'm going to call that elementary school. The Apostle Paul and Barnabas and whoever else traveled with him, it looks like Titus did. It looks like they probably learned about Timothy during that time. But nevertheless, they were in, when it comes to being ministers of Jesus Christ, they were in elementary school. So, oh no, they're being led by the Holy Spirit. Yes, they were. And the words we have written down by Luke and by Paul uh, show that the Holy Spirit was leading them. But I want you to bear in mind, right here, in this particular area, Paul didn't write anything. When he wrote about this area, he wrote Galatians, and he wrote about the people of this time frame 
and in what bad shape they were in. When he wrote Galatians, it was about these people's failures. It's a rebuke. So he go he and he and Barnabas and Titus probably uh, some of if not most of that time they were in this kind of a schooling um, arena. They were getting the elemental truths of how to witness for the Lord on the basis of the gospel of Christ. Nobody knew how to do that. You understand. So as Paul was led of the Holy Spirit, he began to see and understand. Do you think for one second that there would not have been several? what we call aha moments in Paul's first part of his ministry in Acts 13 and 14. Come on, think about it. You go out to start preaching. You don't know everything. So I've been studying. Right. You know how many times you'll foul up in the first year? Innumerable. Say, no, no, no. I've got my doctrine down straight. Amen. Get on with it. Preach it. How many people you have a useless argument with? You have any idea how many of those there will be? No, you don't. All I'm trying to get you to understand is that's the way Paul and Barnabas and Titus were right here. They were in the elementary school district of Paul's ministry. Now, what I want you to notice over here is that from, and I'm going to say 15, Acts 15 is right there, so I'm going to say from 16 to 20 is secondary education. Secondary education. In that period of time, he's going to start, oh, I don't know, a dozen or so places maybe, or eight or ten or whatever it is, He's going to start churches or groups of people, Bible studies and whatever. And he's going to write Galatians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and 1st Corinthians. At the end of this period of time, which is right here, uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 3 and 4, he's going to write two more books. He's going to write Romans, and he's going to write 2nd Corinthians. He could not have written these books, any of the six of these. He couldn't have written them back here. What prompted Paul to write is absolutely guarantee you it's the Holy Spirit. But the prompting of the Holy Spirit led him to write the book of Galatians. Then it looks like it led him to write 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and then 1st Corinthians. And then there was some time span, perhaps as much as a year to two years, before he then, after he left Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, he wrote Romans, fundamental truth of the word of God for the dispensation that he was fixing to tell people about, and 2 Corinthians, a fundamental way to bridge from this part of Paul's ministry into the graduate level of Paul's ministry. I'm not trying to blow smoke at you about educational process. I'm trying to get you to understand some things about the elemental truths that Paul was preaching in order to get to the capstone of his doctrine over here, which, and just we'll catch up to this later, which I'm saying is to you is Ephesians and Colossians. This is the capstone truth. You can put Philippians right there also. This is the capstone of the truth of God Almighty's word for the church, the body of Christ. So it's elemental, secondary, and graduate level studies. I know it's simple. I know that there's nothing in here that's complicated. Absolutely nothing that is complicated. But none of you should, if you're first starting out in your ministry, none of you should take people to Ephesians chapter 2, 3, and 4 and say, don't you understand that? The reason you shouldn't do that is because you didn't understand it the first time you saw it either. Give as much grace as you take. All right, now, if you will, look at what else Paul does here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 to get a grip on what he's leaving. When he writes these books that you're reading, he's leaving this area. He's not going... In Acts chapter 20, he's not going anywhere else to start a church. He's going to Jerusalem. What his intention is, according to Romans, is he's going to go to Spain. 
Don't think he ever got to Spain, not biblically anyway, but I do know that he did not start any more churches after he wrote 2 Corinthians. He didn't start any more. He wrote to some people that he didn't know, as well as in the Philippians, some people he did know. Now look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He says of these people who are contrary to him, and yet he's comparing himself to them because he's boasting himself a little as, as would it be against them because of what they are. Notice what he says, verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Did that make any difference to the Corinthians? Yes, it did. The Corinthians knew wherein lie the word of God. They went to synagogues in order to find the way to follow the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that's where Paul found them. Keep reading. Verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Why would he say I am more? Because he knew them. He knew what they knew, but he knew what he knew. He knew he had been the recipient of the mysteries of God. In 1 Corinthians, he said, Let a man so account of us as, as uh, ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. He's not pulling anybody's leg, but neither is he backing down from someone's supposed authority. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, he said. Keep reading. Middle of verse 23. In labors more abundant. I think at this point right here, we can probably call Paul a 30 year veteran. He's been preaching about 30 years right there, not quite, but close to it. Somewhere between 22 and 23 years uh, as, as preaching goes, and some other years added in there. You can add them up. But nevertheless, he says, in labors more abundant. And then he shows how ugly it got. Keep reading. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Interesting terminology, don't you think? Oft, as in often? He was close to death often? He was around death? He feared for his death? Yes. So what's he afraid of? He's afraid of dying. He hadn't done what the Lord will call him to do. Keep reading. Verse 24, Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. And there was that be forty, or five times he got thirty-nine stripes of, with a whip. I don't think I could take one. I certainly couldn't take one time of thirty-nine stripes. But he did. How did he do that? In all, verse 25, Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. We found that one back in chapter 14 of Acts. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. He wrote this right here, and we can't find that anywhere. You know why Luke didn't record it? I mean, I'm guessing here. But it wasn't noteworthy. So uh, surely it must have been noteworthy. Look how persecution uh, uh, has been taken, care, uh, taken note of since then. Maybe that's a problem. Maybe there would be more of us standing up for the word of God and preaching the gospel of the, with the, the, till our lungs burst out if there wasn't so much notice of persecution. I mean, come on, Christ died for your sins and you've got eternal life. What do you care how much you're persecuted? Keep reading. A night and a day I've been in the deep. I don't know when that was. Now verse 26. In journeying, journeyings often, in perils, obviously in these journeyings, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, the Jews, in perils by the heathen, people who weren't Jews or who weren't practicing Jews, in perils in the city. Every town he went to, they wanted to kill him, throw him in jail or whatever. In perils... Uh, in the sea, as in a night and a day in the deep, perils of waters, in perils among false brethren. Remember what he said about false brethren in Galatians 2? You'll hear it in a bit. 
Verse 27, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often. And that implication there is not fastings uh, for the glory of the Lord, but fastings because there wasn't any food. Uh, uh, in cold and nakedness. Now watch this. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So what did Paul do every day to care for churches? Do you realize how many times Paul said that he prayed continually for people? I don't even know how he did that. Paul told us, pray without ceasing. Do you do that? He told us to continue instant in prayer. I think I got a better grip on that one. But my point about all this is, come on, we, we're we looking at a man here that the Lord put through a mighty tough elementary school, then sent him out where it really got tough, and he writes about it like, the Lord saw me through it, please read on. Verse 29, who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forever and forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. And then he tells how it all started. Verse 32, In Damascus, the governor under Aretas the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. And through a window in a basket was I led down, let down by the wall and escaped his hands. Look over in chapter 12, verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Hmm. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Then he says, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now again, I'm not trying to make some sort of a schooling issue out of this. I want to make a comparison of what he was learning. In Acts 13 and 14, it was, <clears throat> it was elemental stuff. I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit had to teach him how to preach the gospel of Christ. Read it and see. In between Acts chapter 16 and Acts chapter 20, it was like going to a, a secondary school where you're thrust in amongst people you don't know. I mean, you know how it is, the first sixth grade, seventh grade, kindergarten and the first grade, you go out there and you know the same people all the time. Same school, same people, same ones, same ones, same ones, old Pete and old Joe and old Freddie, and on and on it goes. Then you go to junior high. And two years later, you're thrust into high school. And you get amongst people that come from about five or six different uh, elementary schools. And you get into a situation where you don't know which way's up. And you don't know who the good guys are and the bad guys are. And you don't know how to follow after this one or follow after that one. You don't know whether somebody's pulling your leg or whether a teacher's going to grab you by the nap of the neck. Well, they don't do that anymore. But nevertheless, some of you know what that's like. Well, that was, a, that was a scalding experience right there for many of you. Strangely different. Where Jack and I went to school, we went to, all my family, practically every one of them, went to one building for 12 years. Grades 1 through 12. Now, what happened to us between the 6th and 7th grade is that up to 6th grade, we sat in one room except for recess, maybe music. But in the seventh grade, we had to hop from classroom to classroom to classroom to classroom. The teacher didn't move. The students moved. In seventh grade on, that was strange to me. I enjoyed it, but I found myself getting in trouble all the time. Got three minutes between classes, moved from one place to the other. Had a locker of all. Didn't have a desk? What happened to my desk? I don't have a desk. I had a locker. It's strange things. Well, think about Paul going from this, this basically 12 years in one land, into this, where he's all over the place, he's got different men traveling with him, and he finds different forms of idolatry everywhere he goes. Look, what, what do you suppose Paul thought when he got into Thessalonica? Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I mean, it's one of the first places he goes after Philippi in uh, 
uh, Acts chapter 17 or start of 18, look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Now when he went to Thessalonica, he got into a synagogue. Amen? Yes, he did. Look at this. Verse 9. For they themselves, talking about the other people who know these people, show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You mean Paul went into a synagogue and found people in serving idols in there? Yes, he did. You mean Jews were serving idols? Yes, they were. Had been for about 600 years, you recall. That's what, that's the baptism he got right there. I mean, that's the kind of places he went to. That isn't all. Think of this, how this was. In Acts chapter, say, 13, he's sitting there in Antioch. He's praying the Lord's leadership upon him. And the Holy Ghost says, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So they laid their hands on them and separated them and sent them out. And things begin to happen. All of a sudden there, Paul is thrust into the uh, pre preeminent position, the forefront. He's doing the major preaching. And he goes, goes from one place to another in this time for about 12 years. And he's got this thing down so he knows exactly what he's going to do. He knows how to evade those rocks that are thrown at him. And he knows when it's time to get out of town. And I know that I shortened that down and whatever. I know. But that's the kind of thing it was here. But when he comes over here, the first thing he does is he tries to go somewhere he thinks he ought to go to, and the Holy Spirit won't let him. So he tries again, the Holy Spirit won't let him a second time. And then he gets a vision in the night of a European talking to him, saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. Does he really want to go to Europe? Well, he did now. Did now. And so look what he runs into all of these places, including you can throw in Berea there, whom he didn't write a letter to, but he went to. Throw in Ephesus there. He didn't write a letter to them either, but he went there twice. And one, the second time he went there for three years. Now, all I'm trying to get you to understand about the, go, coming to this spot in the book of Acts is that you shift gears from here to here. Go back to Acts chapter 14 now. Acts 14. After Paul was left for dead, and we didn't read all of this, but, but we, maybe we'll get back to it for one reason or another. Verse 21. He gets up from being left for dead and goes back into the city and begins to preach. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. This is roughly second or third time to all these towns. It's going right around and around in the circle there. Verse 30, uh, 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I probably am going to come to back to that passage later on. If I get to chapter 28 and you haven't heard me talk anymore about we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God, call me on it. Verse 23, And when they had ordained them elders in every church, all of these churches then were left with an elder. Now, lest you think that is a good thing, you want to pay close attention to what he finds there and has to write back to them in the book of Galatians about what's going on. Who are these elders and why did they let that occur? So don't automatically think that what Paul's giving you there or the, gospel, the scripture is giving you there is an instruction to ordain elders. If you want to find an instruction about that, then you go to Titus chapter 1 and you read it very carefully. And do not leave out any of the words. It's not appointing elders on the basis of their popularity, nor is it simply because they are old. It's because having an experience level that the Lord could see, they are to do a thing the Lord ordained. 
you read Titus chapter 1 very carefully about that. And don't just call me and tell me that you think it's just old guys who are, know how to handle money in the church and therefore they ought to be the leaders. That's not what's going on, not anywhere close. So don't do that. Don't think that way. But look at verse 23. And when they had ordained them elders in every church they, and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed throughout Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down into Italia, and you've just read most of the towns there and most of the places there that Paul had been doing this thing for about 12 years where he had all those elders. Now notice, Verse 26, and thence, from Italia, thence sailed to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they... Somebody tell me what that last word is in that verse. Why, it's the word fulfilled. Ain't that something? They, when they, when they ordained the elders and went on their way, they fulfilled the ministry that they were called to. Remember chapter 13, verse, go back there, chapter 13, verse uh, uh, 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. Chapter 14, verse 26. Uh, they, uh, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. They were called unto a work and they fulfilled the work and it was over with. If it's fulfilled, how filled is it? It's filled full. It's over with. That work's over with. Now it looks like a little rest is in order here. Look at verse 27. And when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them, a total of about 12 years worth, and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles, and there they abode long time with the disciples. I don't know how long long time was, but let's just assume that it was six months. You still got about 12 years of them roaming this area until they fulfilled the ministry. Now, question then arises, what form of ministry was fulfilled? Well, I want you to notice something here in these last few minutes. What's different? Well, as you well know, in Acts chapter 15, there's a, a cause for Paul with Barnabas and with Titus. There is a cause for them to go to Jerusalem and to tell the people in Jerusalem What's been going on? Hold on to Acts 15 and go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians 2. And I don't know whether you believe this or not, but I believe that Galatians chapter 2 is a record, Paul's record, of him going to Jerusalem in Acts 15. And I'm probably going to talk about this again next week, so just if you, if you think I'm missing, leaving something out, I probably am. Notice in chapter 2, verse 1. Then fourteen years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Please notice he didn't say past tense right there. He said preach. Well, he's been here in this period of time frame in this what I call elementary school learning how to preach the gospel. The gospel preached was as in Romans thir I mean Acts chapter 13 verse 38 and 39 and it's how that through this man Jesus Christ is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses he learned how to preach that gospel and he says he did it not only says he did it, he fulfilled his job. And not only that, he goes to Jerusalem in order to tell the people in Jerusalem that gospel which I preach, he says. That gospel. Well, does that tell you that they knew it or they didn't know it? They didn't know it. The people in Jerusalem, 
did not know, in Acts chapter 15, they did not know the gospel that Paul was preaching. Say, so, well, he must have told Peter. What do you mean he must have told Peter? He saw Peter, according to chapter 1, verse uh, uh, 19, 18 and 19, he saw Peter and James, the Lord's brother, and he didn't see any other apostles. If you'd have been him and you had the gospel of Christ as, as what was in your mind that you had to go preach and you were in the company of the men in Jerusalem but the only apostles that were there were Peter and the Lord's brother, would you really have told the two of them the gospel of Christ and not told the other eleven? James was still alive, if you recall. No, you wouldn't have. So well, how can you be so sure? I don't have to be sure. I've got a chapter full of Acts chapter 9. I've got chapter 11 when he went down to Antioch. And I've got chapter 13 where he finally preached the gospel of Christ in the book of Acts. And he never preached it prior to that in the book of Acts. And I have no reason to think that he did. None. Nada. If there isn't any scripture to back it up, don't say it. I don't believe Peter knew the gospel of Christ until Paul went there in Acts chapter 15. How you like them apples? Say, well, why are you so angry about it? I'm not angry. I'm adamant. I do not believe in supposing upon Scripture or superimposing upon Scripture. Don't add anything. Don't add it. It's not there. Don't add it. And if you think I've done something wrong in storyizing it, well then you don't have to pay attention to me. But nevertheless, you have no reason to think that Paul preached the gospel to anybody who was at Jerusalem before he went there in Acts chapter 15. You have no other indication except chapter 2 verse 2 that, that uh, you should think otherwise. It was there that by revelation he went up and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Pretty simple, isn't it? All right, go back to Acts then and look in Acts chapter uh, 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them, based upon Galatians 2, it was Titus, uh, should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. They didn't go up there to ask them if they had permission to go someplace. They went up there to tell them what they were doing in the name of the Lord. And we'll get back to more of that later on. But for now, I want you to notice that it says Paul and Barnabas. In verse 2, it says, Paul and Barnabas twice. You know, Barnabas' name, uh, the name of Barnabas is in the Bible 23 times. Um, from Acts chapter uh, 4, uh, all the way through uh, Colossians 4, uh, is named 23 times. Um, I think I'm right about that. But six times, six between Acts 9 and uh, Acts uh, 15, six of the times, Barnabas' name came first. Now you understand that while his name was Saul, but not necessarily afterwards. Notice if you will, in, in Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 15, Peter speaks from verse 7 to verse 11. We're going to talk about that next week, probably. Then notice verse 12. Then all the multitude kept silence. That be the multitude that was there, gathered together in Jerusalem, and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. Why in the world would right there Barnabas' name come first? Well, I'll tell you why I believe. You don't have to believe this. This is not a dogmatic thing. It's just what I believe. All of the time that between Acts 13, verse 13, when Paul's name was mentioned first, 
And all of this preaching was going on in chapter 13 and 14. The emphasis was on the message that the Apostle Paul got by revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, Galatians 1, verse 11 and 12, and it was not on the message that Barnabas had been uh, participating in, if, if you allow me to say that, between Acts chapter 4, where Barnabas first shows up, and Acts chapter 9, when Paul was uh, saved. So I believe that during this time, the ball, after Acts 13, verse 9, Paul's name comes first. But then when you go to Jerusalem and you're there in Jerusalem, Barnabas' name came first. The multitude is listening to the two of them, but it says they gave audience to Barnabas and Paul. I believe that's to emphasize this is a Jewish organization sitting in the capital of the Jews in whatever item of of uh, whatever building they were allowed to meet in there. I have no idea about that. But I believe that's why Barnabas is mentioned first. Now I want you to notice when they wrote to the Gentiles, these same men here, where Peter speaks, then Barnabas and Paul speak, and on and on and on, and then James says what he says to them. I want you to notice verse 22. Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Huh. Not Barnabas and Paul? No. Paul and Barnabas. Notice when they wrote it though, verse 25, this is the writing, it seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Say, well you're making too much of this. Probably am. I believe there are things in the Bible that are in there for us to learn something by. I believe that these people could see that this was Paul's ministry and Barnabas was participating in it, not Barnabas' ministry and Paul participating in it. But when they became authoritative with their word, in other words, they're going to put out this thing with the, uh, with the um, um, uh, decrees for to keep. And if it was going to come from Jerusalem, and it was, then Barnabas' name was in the writing of it was mentioned first again. Now notice at the, at the next thing that happens there is Luke is telling you about something that Paul and Barnabas did after they were delivering these messages. And look at verse 35. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch and on and on. Why, there's Paul's name back there in the front again. A few verses after that, Barnabas gets into it. He and Paul don't agree about something and Barnabas leaves and we'll get to that. But now I want you to notice where he shows up again. Remember now, I called this elementary education. Turn to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I find this to be absolutely extraordinary. Let's see if I can do this here on the, on the timeline. At the end of Acts chapter 15, Barnabas goes away. Barnabas takes Mark... And he goes somewhere else. So we're going to put him up there like that and then we're going to take him off. Now he doesn't appear in the book of Acts ever again. Not there anymore. So we got chapter 16, Paul goes to Philippi. Chapter 17, he goes to Thessalonica and Berea and uh, Athens. And chapter 18, he goes to Corinth and he writes back to uh, the Thessalonians from Corinth. Then he goes Acts chapter 19. He spends three years in Ephesus and he writes Romans and 2 Corinthians after he leaves. He writes 1 Corinthians while he's there and then he writes Romans and 2 Corinthians after he leaves there. Now we're in 1 Corinthians which is written in Acts chapter 19 and look at this. Verse, chapter 9, verse 1. This chapter is all about the strength of the apostleship of Paul. Verse 1. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship it, uh, are ye in the Lord. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? 
Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, or I only and Barnabas? Have not we power to forbear working? Why did he bring Barnabas into that? Why? Barnabas hasn't been with him for several years. Somewhere in the neighborhood of seven years or so. Barnabas has not been with him. Why bring him back into it? Because, my friends, he is talking about apostleship here. Say, well, this is the Corinthian church. He's writing this to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians. Well, you think they didn't know anything about this elementary education Paul and Barnabas had back here? I suspect they did. Elementary education always comes before secondary education, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So over here, why is he bringing Barnabas back into it? Because he's talking about apostleship. And Barnabas was an apostle. And Barnabas had traveled with him for the better part of 14 years. Barnabas was part of who Jerusalem was. These people here in Corinth all high and mighty about following after the law, doing good and all that stuff. He's going to show them something there. The strength of the apostleship is borne out by Barnabas. Compared, he says, I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working? Incidentally, if you want to know what he means there, he means should a preacher be paid by the people that's listening to him? Yes, they should. To forbear working means you put off working in order to preach. To forbear working there means that you don't go do the work you go out and preach. You do what an apostle does. And he says, you think me and Barnabas are the only ones able to do that? He says later on in this chapter, he said, they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. What do you think people think that is? I'm not trying to pick on you. Ever how many of you there are here? I'm not trying to pick on you about that. I'm trying to make you understand something about Paul and Barnabas. And therefore, whoever is teaching you the Bible. And I pray you've got more than one teacher. Because I know the pitifulness of this teacher. But what I'm trying to get you to understand here in the passage is, Paul said, it's not just me and Barnabas. Why did he bring Barnabas into this? Because they knew that Barnabas was an apostle. They understood that. Now, the only other reference to Barnabas is in Colossians 4, which is at the end of Paul's ministry. Go to there. Go to Colossians 4. And, and look with me about this. And if you understand this better than me, I wish you'd write me a letter. This is over here in what I've called while ago secondary, uh, I mean um, uh, graduate studies. And I'm not trying to blow you, smoke at you and tell you how great you are because you understand this or any such thing as that. But I do want you to understand this. In Colossians are people like you and me. And he says here to them, I want you to look at verse, uh, start with me in verse 7. All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for, this, for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With, and he begins to name people here. Now watch carefully. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, and Onesimus, it seems then, was from Colossae. So you, when you read the book of Philemon, you can find him there. Uh, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister's son, to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. Now, Marcus, evidently, Paul thought, would be coming to the Colossians. Why? I don't know. I really don't know why. I know in the passage that he is referred to as sister's son to Barnabas. In my mind, it says that Barnabas was married to Paul's sister and, and that Marcus was his nephew. If you don't like that one, well, you come up with some scenario that fits you. That doesn't make any difference to me. But what I want you to understand is Barnabas is back in Paul's mind. So I've had people ask me the question, do you believe Barnabas was a kingdom saint or was he a body of Christ saint? No, Barnabas was a body of Christ saint. Say, so, well, when did he hear the gospel? I don't know, but he was with Paul preaching it. How could you preach it 
if you hadn't been first partaker of the fruit. How could you do a thing like that? Barnabas was preaching the gospel of Christ. Well, I don't believe just because he separated from Paul and went off to Cyprus with Marcus, I don't believe he just quit preaching to you. I don't believe he would have been included later in Paul's ministry by name, both in 1 Corinthians and in Colossians 4, if he'd have quit preaching. I mean, Paul didn't say very kind things about people who fouled up the doctrine and if Barnabas had just walked off and quit, I believe Paul would have take, wouldn't have taken that too lightly. Now what I'm trying to get you to understand is the, and pardon my use of the word, but the evolution of the ministry, it's elemental back here. They were learning how to preach the gospel of Christ. And they found out about the opposition to it rather clearly. It is secondary here where not only did they go to a strange and new different kind of people, but they found Jews there who would also believe and it produced those six books. And on and on it goes. I believe that's the bridge that we're getting ready to cross between Acts chapter 14 and Acts chapter 15. I thank you for being here tonight. I hope that, uh, that you've trusted the Lord as your Savior and that you're telling people about it just as avidly and vociferously as the Apostle Paul and Barnabas did. And I appreciate the chance to get to talk with you. So we'll see you next Tuesday night when we continue on with uh, um, uh, basic fundamental rightly dividing and then next Wednesday night back here in the book of Acts in Acts chapter 15. Good night, everybody.